Uh, okay, to the Polo Archive. Finally, we're here. Finally. I got Jesse to sit down and fucking do this after months. I know there's some serious haters out there who have been like, like still sending me messages like, you guys are liars. The Polo Archive's not coming. What's going on here? Yeah. But, Sorry, guys. Yeah. I'm doing this for the love. The haters can fuck off. <laughs> like my background it's great mukalaki hiki come on you want to lay me (laughs) this reminds me of fucking uh wayne's world where they're like i'm in delaware yeah (laughs) (laughs) um okay so today pretty rad tell us about uh your polo your polo collecting and how you why you got into it and why you like polo in the first place well um first of all I want to tell people that I wasn't ever like down with the low life culture or anything like that. That was not part of my life. Um, I got into vintage polo strictly through the vintage business. Um, growing up, you know, when we, when we were teenagers, we used to listen to hip hop and, you know, there's a lot of influence there. Um, but also, just growing up, mom and dad used to take us to the outlet mall on Military Road in Niagara Falls, New York. And uh, we used to go buy polo. And I remember um, distinctly, actually, it's a funny story. One Christmas, mom bought us bear knits, which probably was around 92. So I was like 14, 15 at the time. Yeah. And... I remember we were both like, what the fuck? I don't want to wear this. I'm not wearing a sweater with a fucking teddy bear on it. So just to give me people. I don't even think we have, I don't remember any pictures of us in those. And I can't, I was only 12, so I can't even remember that, tell you the truth. Yeah, I remember it. And I remember being annoyed. I was like, what the fuck? I don't want this bear, (laughs) teddy bear sweatshirt. This is whack. Um, But anyways, yeah, we just used to wear a polo. And then as I got a little bit older in uh as a teenager you know that's what we would go get it was like tommy nautica polo i mean not in that order necessarily but it was just those were the outlet those were the outlet stores at the outlet mall and we wanted to be fly you know so i i know we have pictures of you wearing uh hill figure outdoors and oh yeah and different things like that and so for those people that like he's talking about the outlet mall in in Niagara Falls, New York, because we lived on the Canadian side, and everybody in those days did all their shopping over the. We called it over the river because we had to go over an actual river, and our dad still says over the river, even if he just drives over the border now. <laughs> but, <laughs> in Washington, <laughs> yes. That's awesome. um, but you go over the river and you'd load up because the Canadian dollar was was more equal to the U.S. dollar at some points and. You'd bring back all this shit and try to sneak it into Canada duty free, but that's what he. Yeah, we about. used to wear dirty shoes over, like our rungiest, oldest shoes, and just throw them out, and wear <laughs> brand new shoes across, so we didn't have to pay duty. Um, we even used to go and get groceries over in the states. It was that yeah. that much cheaper? So and gas and if, cigarettes if you're a if you're hacking butts. Oh yeah, go to yeah, that's right, Chippewa. <laughs> Chippewa, man. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that, well, that, that, that was my earliest memories of polo was wearing polo in my teenage years, you know, trying to look dope, trying to look fly, have a little bit more flashy and more expensive gear on, but I didn't necessarily know about like all of the fast, like all of the sub labels, all of the lines and, and things like that. It was just like, yo, I got a nice polo shirt. I got a, a nice polo sweater or sweatshirt and, or jacket. And that was cool. Um, and then fast forward, probably around 2005, um, I started catching wind of like all the polo culture with the advent of the internet and that of like all the polo culture, uh, you know, primarily based around New York, obviously, Red, you know, Shout Reggie, uh, Dem Dares, like Chicago and that. And there was like people all over doing it, but primarily in New York. And that kind of was like, oh, wow, this is really 
interesting and, you know, started, you know, doing some research on it and seeing more of it because we were always picking polo, yeah. you know, not because it was polo, but because it was an expensive brand, you know? So it's like, if you see a sweater in the rag that was Ralph Lauren, you know, it was $160, $200 brand new. Why wouldn't you pick that? You know? Totally. So we're always picking polo, but it wasn't until I kind of found out about the culture um, that I started really looking for it, you know, and looking, Oh wow, this is like, this is a sick piece. I've seen this on uh, vintage gear addicts or whatever, you know, like some of the earlier sites that were pushing that culture um, and, and, you know, kind of, uh, documenting it, so to speak. Um, so at this present day, your wardrobe is probably like 95% polo. Yeah. I mean, what I wear on the day to day is probably 75% polo, but yeah, my wardrobe, is, if you were to like add up all my garments and then do the math, yeah, it's probably 95 well, For sure with the collection, but even like, when you go do your personal day-to-day -day shopping now, do you guys still, you still buy polo? Not really, man. No? Uh, you know what? I think because they're doing so many retros, I'm just not really into it. If there's something really cool and unique that comes out, I'll look for it. Um, but I have so much polo that it's like, I don't want the retro shit. And what I else do you need? need? You're probably good yeah, for a long, what else do you long need? time. And a lot of the re, a lot of the redos are kind of, of a lesser quality without going too deep into it for people that don't know can you like talk about the low life culture in new york in the beginning yeah sure um so there was a, the low life gang or club or you know group of people if you will um i don't know what they call themselves um but the, yeah it was a group of guys from uh, the boroughs in New York, um, primarily Brooklyn, I believe, you know, I'm sure there's guys from the Bronx and Queens and, and other boroughs, but um, it was a boosting culture. So it was like guys that basically wanted to have dope gear, uh, people from low income neighborhoods that didn't have the means financially to buy this nice gear. It w they were going and boosting it. They were the boosting is, uh, shoplifting they were going and stealing it yeah um you know and th i think that was part of the esteem was like how much could you get but it, i mean it was all i, I mean you can't, don't quote me on any of this but this is my you know what i've discerned from what i've done the research and that yeah is that basically these guys wanted to have dope gear they wanted to look fly they wanted to bring they wanted to be able to say, yo, I have, look at me, I fly, I have all this sick gear and, um, you know, I got money. And so, yeah, it was a boosting culture. So it was, it's, yeah, it started as like a, a like to up your classism and show that you got this crazy gear. And from yeah. what we've heard and talked to people, they used to like, they used to ransack the stores. Like it wouldn't be one guy going to, to boost a jacket. They would run in 10 guys deep and just all run out so that hope, like, hopefully no one got caught but if someone did it would be maybe one yeah. guy it's like one sacrifice for the team type deal and you're all getting yeah. shit and just you just grab handfuls and run like from and i remember we we met this guy who worked on long um uh cape cod and he was like i used to work for polo sport and he said i worked in the stores and he was like i was witness to some of those events well that, that that's actually ben and now he's the vice president of double rl um, good friend of mine, and he did work at the Polo Sports Store when it first opened. And he said, like, guys would come in, and it was like, yeah, they wouldn't, they would just rack it, run out with tons of shit, you know, <laughs> like, like as much as you could carry, and out, and jump on the train and be gone. Yeah. Um, and they always wanted, like, talk about the different lines because they were going for certain shit. It was the flashy stuff. You know, I think. It was like they wanted to make sure people knew that they were wearing polo. So they weren't trying to steal a, a nondescript golf shirt. They wanted bright colors, flashy things, interesting pieces, graphic pieces, statement pieces. So they would go in and get things like the Unicrest line, the Cookie line, um, the Ski line, the Suey line, um, 
anything with big graphics, anything that was bold and bright and flashy and unique and cool, interesting. Um, I mean, that's what they seem to have gravitated towards. If you look at old low life pictures, they're all styling in, you know, the earliest stuff is like, you know, the Crayola kind of uni stuff and the circle ski bits. And so uni stuff is what era? I believe uni stuff is late eighties, okay. maybe into 90. Um, and again, like I'm a collector, but I'm not like the end all be all of the knowledge here. Yeah, if we um, say some shit that's not true, it's okay. We can't know it all. People know that on this show already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Read the disclaimer at the beginning. Um, but yeah, um, like, like stuff yeah. from like 87, basically. Like there was cookie ski stuff out in 87, I believe. Um, maybe even 85. Um, and then onwards. So. Yeah. And so back then, this is the beginning of what we now call like holo culture and low life culture. And then how did it get to where we are now where, I mean, the polo market's kind of fluctuated over the last like five years because of all the retros and what's going on, yeah. but it still holds value. Since we've been in this game, polo pieces have held value. Some have gone up, some have come down, but like, it's always been a commodity we've picked and had a lot of value basically. Right. So how did we get from that to where we are now through like hip hop and all this other things that created this movement? Well, I remember like when I started, like when it came on my radar and I started getting interested in it around, like I said, 2005, 2006, you could still find tons of stuff on eBay for a steal. Um, I think it quickly... Because that was still when like not a lot of people knew and it was just certain people looking probably. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I think like closer to 2010, it started to accelerate. You started to like things were starting to go for more money. And I think it was all on the heels of that, man. It was all on the heels of the culture, the hip hop culture. I mean, you have like, like if you dig deep, there's like, you know, rap groups that speak about polo, talk about polo, like, you know, Artifacts, um, Sadat X, you know, you've got Mob Deep talking about polo. People even wearing polo in music videos. Nas wearing polo and polo sport. Raekwon. Um, yeah, Raekwon with the snow beach. I mean, that's probably the most like known thing, right? Like, but there was tons of guys wearing polo or rapping about polo and Ralph Lauren and polo sport. And uh, I think it was when like vintage streetwear, vintage urban clothing kind of came into vogue that it kind of came on most people's radar. And then, I mean, I'd say in the last 10 years, um, the lowlifes have got a lot of shine. You know, they've, like, even Ralph Lauren has recognized them and put some of those guys on, profiled them on the website or done bits with them or had them model stuff. Like, I know Thurston Howell. Would yeah, model who, for people that don't know, he has one of the craziest collections, right? He was one of the, he is like the, I believe the founder or one of the founders of the lowlifes. Same with Rack Low. <laughs> um, and there's other guys, so please don't, you know, people watching this, don't take any disrespect. I'm not an expert on it, but Thurston and Racklow are certainly the some couple of the forefathers of that whole movement. Um, and there was other gangs, too, that were doing that, or clubs, or whatever you want to call them. Like, there's the Decepticons um, that were also boosting. Uh, the lowlifes, I mean, they're the lowlifes for a reason, and that's, that. you know, they... I would say it was, it's, they're responsible for putting that shit on the map. If it wasn't for those guys, it would have just lost in the sauce. Yeah. But they and then, brought it into hip hop culture. They, you know, they made it cool and urban, um, synonymous with like early hip hop culture, early urban culture that now people looking back, wanting to emulate that people into vintage, are you know wanting to be a part of that yeah and uh we're about to get into this collection we're going to start today with the country tease so give us like a quick rundown just so people know what to expect in future episodes like how many categories here are we going to be covering um we're going to cover a lot um i'm not a huge collector of like stadium or 92 that's just not my bag it never really was i'm not a huge snow beach collector uh, I'm more into like obscure bits. I do have some of that, like I have P-Wing bits and I have stadium stuff and I have 
you know, some of those really popular lines. Um, but I'm kind of more into obscure bits and I have men's, I have a lot of women's too. I have kids stuff. For me, it's not so much like, it's more about the collecting unique things than having like, um, like every stadium piece it was never my thing. And also being in the business crew, you know that like sometimes when we got those bits, it was kind of like, shit, should I keep this or should I sell this for 1500 bucks? Yeah, 100%. And people always ask like, why didn't you keep more of that or that? But you're like, I'm not going to wear a $1,500 t-shirt or I'm not going to rock around in this, in this polo jacket. If someone's going to offer me 800 bucks at the bowl, you know, we're taking that money sometimes. So that, that's exactly. why we're still in business. We're still in business, right. So, <laughs> but a lot of the collection too is tailored around my style. So, you know, I wear earth tones. I'm 42 years old. I'm a dad. I'm not going out wearing Crayola, yellow, green, blue, red, flashy, boom, boom, boom. That's just, I just don't wear that kind of clothing. Yeah. So, so you've I told me before to too, like, you know, when you look at Polo versus other brands, Polo stayed very true to its American kind of, uh, like, it sells the, the American dream in a weird way of, of culture and fashion and like, Western styling and these things that are synonymous with polo, but also like American life, I guess. Um, and they've also not done, they haven't ever sold out. They haven't ever like done collab, a lot of these collabs that other brands have done. They haven't really strayed very far from their roots. And they're not like, they're not like a Gucci. They're not, but they're not, they're like in the middle, like a high end brand, but they're not like unobtainable either. Mm -hmm. um so so yeah speak a little bit about that and like double rl and like yeah the, well, design. i mean i think you know ralph lauren always had a vision it was it was a bit of the american dream per se so a lot of his lines dating back way back um to the late 80s mid 80s even and then more predominantly into the early 90s um paid homage to early Americana. So you have like workwear, motorcycle culture. Um, you have- um, Western wear. Western wear, you know, you have um, like all of those Even military, like, military, huge. Yeah, military. Um, sport. And, and uh, like uh, First Nations clothing. First Nations up. clothing. Yeah. Um, Aboriginal kind of stuff. Also um, sportsman gear. You know, like things that were hunting, actually born, fishing, hunting, fishing, outdoorsman type of stuff, right? So that was kind of like that was Americana with clothing. If you're looking at it from a historical perspective, and um, it, it all clothing, all the categories we just mentioned that you mentioned, hold a purpose in our daily lives. They're clothing that was made to do something. You're wearing this bike, functional. functional clothing. And I've said this before, and I'm sure you can agree. The best styling comes from function, function before fashion. 100%, I agree. So yeah, so my collection spans from, probably my earliest pieces are 70s. Um, I have stuff that's modern day, but uh, my favorite stuff is country, but I have a bit of everything. Yeah, and we're gonna and do country teas today. And we're going to do the rest on future episodes. So make sure you come back for more. And I'm going to be getting you on a weekly call like this. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, you heard it here. You heard it here. Okay, Agreed. so let, let's jump into this. So country too, you told me on the phone before, you're like country kind of inspired was pre double RL. Just give the country, lead in by talking about country and double RL and then let's show some of this shit. Okay, so country, country basically in, in my eyes was the predecessor to double RL. It was the line that like predominantly paid homage to Americana. So all those different categories we just spoke on uh, were represented in some way through Polo Country. Um, Polo Country ended and then later on we got Double RL. But I'll segue this in showing you some of the bits. Double RL, if you don't know, is um, Ralph Lauren's high-end line that is vintage inspired. Um, so it's based off of uh, vintage Americana clothing, also some European clothing, but it's, it's high end. It's uh, the ultimate 
homage to vintage yeah. American clothing. And it's, it, they, they have a lot of pieces that are true representations of those pieces. They have many pieces that are total mishmashes of multiple Americana pieces, which is as a vintage dealer, it's super cool to go and just shop it because you can see influence from all eras, right? Like Absolutely. Said, military, There's motorcycle. Um, and yeah, well, we'll show those on some other, on some other episodes. Yeah. Uh, it, it is high end and they've even come out and we've heard from certain people within the company that like double RL doesn't even make money sometimes some years because they spend so much money in development and production of that product from hand distressing items to like the highest quality leathers to hand sewn garments in America. It's, it's just the top of the top quality of, of any brand. In my opinion, out of any brand, it's my favorite brand uh, by far. If I could yeah. buy every piece, every season, I would. Yeah. And then the double RL is RRL. Uh, it, it's the name of their, of, of Ralph Lauren's ranch, right? That's where the name correct. came from. That's correct. Um, so he named it after his ranch. So double RL is actually kind of his brainchild, his like true love of the company. It probably spawned from like him at some point saying like, you know, I've been in this business long enough. I want to like start something that's just true to my heart that I can like, get lit up again about and then mm -hmm. that came out and then we still have it going this day even though sometimes it might not make money because it's such a, so, so much work but he's still going just because Ralph Lauren stays too true to his dream yeah and just to touch on that there was a time actually when you know I, I believe double RL started in 93 and there was a time when they actually shut it down um and then they brought it back again I've yeah. been to the double RL head office, um, the design studio, the showroom. It's absolutely incredible. Um, that was yeah. an incredible memory. Uh, one more thing okay. I'm going to say before you start showing us some shit is uh, talking about a company like that, not making money. It's, you know, they're selling $800 jeans, five, $600 jeans, $800 jackets, $1,500, $5,000, like leather jackets. Like it's expensive stuff. From the layman going in there and looking at something, you'd think that they're rolling in money, right? And this is, this is like a misconception with a lot of people looking outside in on businesses. You really have no idea. Just because something's expensive or someone's, someone's selling product doesn't mean they're actually making any money. You really, and I just, I say this because I think we do it and people look at us sometimes. There's times when we weren't making money, straight up. Yeah. You know, we were like, fuck, it's tough in this business. And then, but then there's people maybe looking in going like, oh, those guys are rolling in it just because they're selling product. But you really don't judge a book by its cover. 100%. The moment you've been waiting for, let's show some shit. Okay, guys. So today I've got most of my polo country tees here. There's a few missing. I scoured the ends of the earth to find them, but I'll find them and bring them out in the next episode. I think I got 58 tees here. Uh, we're going to start with some pretty blase, plain Jane stuff, um, and then we'll get into some more interesting bits. So here's some Polo Country horsey tees. Um, they did pocket tees with the horse. Um, there's some interesting variations, like this has like a really cool thin ribbing as opposed to like your more traditional ribbing. Yeah, uh -huh. so everyone's seen a horsey pocket tee. The only real difference, well, that ribbing is cool. The only real difference here is that this is country label. This probably literally just cost more because of that when it, it was in the store. Um, yeah. But it, it, and it's like, it's just interesting to see the full line and spectrum. Yeah, and I think like another thing that draws me to country is the color palette. Um, it's a lot of faded colors. It's a lot of pastels, a lot of earth tones. You're not going to see uh, primary colors in this line. Turn that um, rack a little bit, just a teeny bit, so we can see the palette a bit more. There you go. See, there's the palette. And plus, a lot of these are probably faded, but it is, it is like a... But a lot of it was muted, produced yeah. faded. A lot of it was muted and produced faded. So um, another little tidbit I'm going to show you guys uh, about Polo Country. If, you're try if you have country bits and you're trying to figure out uh, if it's men's or women's, there's one really easy way. So men's stuff will say established in 1967. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, can you go a little bit closer? I can zoom in on the thing. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, perfect. Established 1967. Women's will say established 1971. 
Okay. So is that in re reference to, obviously, they started as a menswear brand, and when they first brought out women's in 71? That's correct. 100% okay. correct. Pretty basic, uh, Ralph, but... Ralph Men's was 67, and they, they didn't start doing women's until 71. Just like your sweatshirt, Pier 67. If you notice on so much Ralph Lauren gear, polo gear, they reference 67 on numbers of jerseys, on collegiate apparel, on military apparel. It shows up everywhere. And then here's just another label. So this is kids. So if you can see it, it says Polo Country for Boys. So that's youth. And, that actually, and so that, that says established 1978. Okay. So 78, the year I was born, they started doing youth mm, Interesting. So uh, as, from, as far as your knowledge on the, the, the Country Key graphics, did yeah. they do a lot of graphics in kids and adults, or was there special kids-only graphics? Um, there was kid-only variations. So colorways and stuff. Colorways and also like um, – for instance, with Indian head tees, they made long sleeve tees for youth. They didn't make any long sleeve tees, to my knowledge, for men or women. Okay. Cool. So variations, okay? Okay. So here's another couple, just horsey tees, just great colors, you know, like faded purple, um, like a light pastel pink. Those look great together. They do. Here's a really cool one. Embroidered? Embroidered pocket tee with a oh, navy, uh, navy inspired insignia. Nice. Also, some, you know. I know what everyone's thinking right now. They're all like, get to the graphics. And don't worry, we're getting to the graphics. <laughs> getting to the graphics. I'm trying to ease in. It's just the tip right now. We're lubing you up. We're lubing you up. So, another cool thing about uh, country was that a lot of logos. Um, that you'd see later on popped up first, at least to my knowledge, on country stuff. So like, for instance, like a lot of people call this the K-Swiss. Um, so that first appeared country, nice. I don't know if it first appeared country, but like, I feel like these pieces are older than a lot of the other K-Swiss bits that I have. Okay. Um, feel free to, you know, if you know better than I do, you know, comment in, Put it down in the comments. Down. Let us know. We're, like I said, we're not the end-all, be-all, and, and we love the knowledge, so please share. Hell yeah. Share in what we know. So this is a pocket tee on a typical jersey, but these two are like peak woven tees. Okay, I know what everyone's going to ask. Are these single stitch? <laughs> these are. They're all single stitch. We're all, we're all the ones you showed before, probably. Yeah, they all were. So do you think, like, do a quick scan. Are all country tees single? All single. Oh my god. Oh Woo. my god. Woo. Oh. oh man. Dude. <laughs> so here you got country tees with the cookie logo. Yeah, you might you might recognize this logo from the Ephes and Frank logo. Yes, we actually got that logo because we did a contest years and years and years ago and somebody else came up with that and they won the contest. They flipped our logo or they flipped the cookie logo into our logo. But that shows up on lots of polo you're gonna see in this in the next videos, I'm sure. So again, this is like a classic Ralph logo, the sportsman logo. Yep. On country pocket tees. Ooh, we're getting to the sportsman, the goodies. Yeah. There's a lot of specific collectors for sportsmen, I feel like. Yeah. So this is the logo that you might have seen more recently. Um, this is the same logo, very similar to what's on the tag of Polo Country. So that's like a smaller country tag than the other ones you showed, or is it the same size? Um, no, some of them, uh, there's some women's tags are like this wider tag. Okay. So you can't um, like... You know what? There's, so many, there's so many variations now that I look at it closely. Yeah. Like look at this tag. Yeah, and that's a sewn on both sides. And then there's a that's sewn, sewn on both sides. Country. This is sewn at the seam. And that's a lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting and so, something about collecting that you can't do if you don't really hold product is you can't put all these different things side by side and study the differences in the minute details, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's something I should probably do. I've been so wrapped up in just collecting and living life and working and raising kids that I've never really 
sat down to like really investigate that. Um, what about the years, man? Do you know the years country ran? I don't, but I wanted to say this because I thought about this earlier on my way here. Um, I'm friends with Allison who runs the archive. So we should get her on a podcast, that, dog. We should definitely try to get her on a podcast. If I can't, I'm going to talk to her and try to get some dates. Okay, um, we'll get some dates, but it give like a rough date, rough date range. I'm going to say late 80s to the mid 90s, but I, again, I'm shooting in the dark. Okay. And I, then you mentioned on the car uh, on the phone too that they they started to redo country graphics but we don't know if it's a country tag or if it's it is just... a country tag okay so they redid the country tag we're going to also bring to you an example of the new country tag versus the old country tag we'll figure that out for you you got it so this is the logo that you would have seen on a lot of the knits and stuff when they redid the country line um so here's a few Again, they're pretty basic, but I just, if I see it, I keep it. I grab it and keep it. Another one that they did, Polo USA with the flag. So That's an know, interesting flag. That's uh, five, that's only what? Four, 13 star flag? Yeah. What does that mean? It's a good question. Something to look up for the next episode. <laughs> um, or somebody else look it up and put it in the comments. But they did this logo on sweats and hoodies as well in the country line. And I have some of those when we get into sweats. Um, and they did this logo. I mean, they did this motif a lot later as well. So, again, I don't know if this is the first Polo USA flag. But you can see that a lot of the classic logos are represented here in the country line. This is a really great one. Polo Sportsman Ralph Lauren. Bring it super close, can you? Oh, sick. Okay, so it's Fish and Rod. Yeah, nice. But it's, it's Ralph's <laughs> Marina, Bait and Tackle, Key Largo, Florida. So those that know, you know, um, highly sought after line is uh, Ralph's Florida line. This is part of that. Which, and that's like the Key West stuff? Yeah, Key West. Uh, I mean... For this particular sweat line, there was like a lifeguard or lifesaver. Uh, there was a marina. This is felt lettering. There's the pier. Um, there's maybe four or five different ones. Really cool. Hard to find. Um, I have one more crew neck in this line. That this your, your hoodie has the overhood, which is This sick. is an overhood. So that's really cool. For vintage people, you know, you'll recognize this as after hood. Really cool. But yeah, again, like, Ralph's Marina, there was a lot of stuff that came later for Ralph's Marina. There was Florida stuff that came later as well. So, and again, it's, you know, sportsmen. That's why I'm sitting on the beach, people. I'm in Florida right now. Look at me go. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a really cool one. Uh, Polo Ralph Lauren State Fair. Uh, I've got a couple of these. Actually, i got a few. Of these. Oh, you, we still have the original tee that they used for inspo on that. That's right. So That's sitting at the warehouse, a lot of the graphics on this stuff was, you know, I'm not going to say it was straight jock, but it was pretty jocked off of other stuff. So they would find a really cool vintage graphic, take it, redo the, uh, you know, the wording, touch it up a bit and change it to their liking. Um, but this is a great one. So, yeah. And then, no, this one isn't. But hold on one sec, I want to show you guys this. Pretty awesome. I have a dead stock one. Nice. So this came from Sims uh, Department Store. It was originally $40, then marked down to $19.99, then marked down to $17.99. And now in my collection. Now worth thousands. Another not great. Really, not really. Okay. So here you see Double RL Ranch. A couple of these guys. And Double RL Cattle Co. Which you'll see later, later in different items as well. And obviously that was inspired from the ranch, which later inspired just the whole line Double RL. Yep. Double RL, Western Star. 
Again, cool. with the Cattle Co. logo on the sleeve. Um, these last two that I showed you are women's, and I haven't ever found these graphics in men. Um, Maybe they don't exist. Women, yeah, if you know of their existence, let us know, because we love to see them. So this one, a lot of people refer to as the calendar tee. Um, great graphic. These are men's tees. Showed up pretty close. What's it say in the red at the bottom? It's Nothing the calendar. Up. Oh, okay. So you've got July 1991. Nice. Okay, so this is 91. Here we've got some sportsmen. These are called the front pages, right? Yeah. Spring 91. And the front These page just refers to basically um, – it was taken from like a sporting magazine or something. Right? Yeah, I know Jace knows knows what it's called. It's called it might be just Sporting Life or like one of the old fishing magazines. There's a different one called Sporting Life. Oh, there actually. is. Um, yeah, because if you find you find all these old hunting and fishing mags from the '40s, all the graphics were like this, basically. Yep. So this is a women's. Oh no, sorry, this is a boys. Interesting enough, but it actually would fit me. Um, and another thing about this country stuff, the sizing was wonky. So like you could find some stuff that was an XL that's like tiny and then you might find a medium that fits you. Um, it's a little bit all over the place. So here's uh, just a different colorway. And again, slightly different color. Now getting to some of my, oh, actually before that, I wanted to show this. So this is a dead stock. Polo Sportsman Country Tee. Different than the one we just saw, though. Different than the one we just saw. This one actually came out of Asia. If you can see that tag, it's the Asian tag. Yeah. Japanese. So is, is the difference, is there any differences on the woven tag or no? Just, just doing a little research here, guys. Just, you know, got to check it out. Yes, there is. What's the difference? Hold on one sec. So a lot of this stuff, like, you know, while you're checking that out, there's, there's Asian releases for a lot of the polo stuff and there's some rare colorways and, you know, the same garment, but different colorway, different tagging, small variations that you might not have known. Like Japan had uh, Japan only releases for some polo stuff. So, yeah. So this one says registered U S patent office on the bottom. Cool. And this one is a different graphic. I'm gonna have a bitch of a time holding it back up. But uh, brand new with tags, never been worn from spring 91. So sick. So sick. It's All worth right, it. My it's favorite for the now. Okay. Hold on. Oh yeah. Let's go. Now we're getting into Indian heads. Okay. The so you were asking about different variations for the different, you know, for men's, women's, and boys. So these are all long sleeves and these were only done for boys. So these are youth tees. Question, side note is, you know, obviously this shit won't fly today. Is Ralph Lauren still putting out Indian head product? The last, yeah, some of it. Um, have you seen like them come out with any of this stuff? Cause, you like, as you look at like the Braves and all these, all these teams are getting canceled and stuff. So like, yeah, it's an the Indian thing head to know. Knit, they did a variation on the Indian head knit not too long ago uh, in the last few years. And I think maybe five or six years ago, they put out denim and supply, put out this exact graphic on it. Oh yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. Um, which I have somewhere, and I'll try to bring it out in a future episode just so we can compare. Um, so, yeah, so these are boys, long sleeves, exceedingly rare. Not many people have these. We got some men's ones. This is like a cream off white. And then I've got a bunch of these pinks, but they're all kind of different. Dang. Dang. And like, interesting how bright the graphic can be on some of them and not so bright on others. Obviously, that has to do with 
washing and fading. Looks like we got a lot of doubles. There's going to be a sale at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah, might actually get me in a headlock for that, but yeah. Um, but also in the Indian head tee, I know there's a black out there that has evaded me for a long time. And I believe there's a forest green. If you know of other colors, put it in the comments. Um, so yeah, this one is the catfish. Uh, yeah, show it up close. It's hard to see that graphic in like the, the bad lighting. Oh, that's better. So it's a catfish on the ground with the fishing rod behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got it. With the Dead fishing rod catfish. behind it, the fifth basket there. It says Fulton, New York. Here's another one. This one's extremely faded, but same tea. Don't, get, don't get fucking catfished, people. <laughs> don't get catfished. It's likely that a lot of these teas came in different colors. I mean, I have different colors in some of them, but I certainly that, don't have all of them. That's an extreme state of collecting when now you're trying just to get the variations and colors of all these garments. There could be 20 colors of each of these teas. There could be. I've only seen the gray mare in gray. I don't know. Makes sense. But, uh, this is a cool one. The Grey Mare brand feed rolled oats. Oh, yeah. Cookies and whatever it is. Cooks in, what does it say? Cooks, Cooks in, three in three minutes. minutes. Yeah. Sorry. So, but that's like, a, that's not, that's not, that's like a reference to like rolled oats oatmeal for humans. That's right. It's not, not a feed yeah. tea. Yeah. 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 It's rolled oats. Uh, Grey Mare brand rolled oats. It'd be interesting to see is that, that actually a brand? Do we know? I don't, I'm not aware of it. Okay, somebody do the research. Let us know in the comments. Um, the whitewater fishing and tackle. Nice. Another good one. All the colors. Maybe not all, but the ones I got anyway. And last but not least, I have a lot of these. I don't know how, but... Here's Those Malvern rolled oats. Dude, that's crazy. <laughs> Got the red. So this collection's been being accumulated for what? Eight years? Nine years? Yeah, about that. And then I got three of these guys. Damn. Damn. So yeah, that's... Uh, that's... That's the bulk of my country tees, but I do have, I do have a couple more sportsman ones that I have to dig up. I have a beige calendar tee. Um, like I said, I have pink RL uh, motorcycle club RL riders tee that I gotta find, and then I have a couple Indian Chief TPTs. Question: How many yes. front pages were there? Do you know? Roughly. There were quite a few. So you're missing a lot of front pages. I'm missing quite a few. How many did you show us? Like two or three mm. graphics? Only two no, graphics. Three. Yeah, two or three, I, yeah. So there's probably like like upwards of 10 different front pages? No, I think there's maybe two or three more. Okay. Um, but there's also, I've seen more color variations on those tees than any, than any other ones. Okay. So there you have it. The country tees, the beginning of the... Polo Archives, finally coming at you. Drop mad knowledge. Give us a quick fucking pan of some other shit so they know what's coming in future episodes. The wall. The front page is also, by the way, was on like turtlenecks and jackets, correct? Yes. Over those different uh, graphics. Uh, yep. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few variations. We'll get into fleece and, and jackets and button-ups and stuff later. Okay. Here's the, this is all just jackets. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven racks. Plus what's on the wall. Nice. Plus I got all these bins here full. Couple bags there full. There's a lot people. And then there's, um, you know, my walk-in closet at home full. I had to pull some bits out of it today, but there's a oh, lot. You, have, you haven't brought it all over. You still got stuff at home. Tons. <laughs> okay uh so give oh, us one more thing drew i found something i wanted to show you because i know you were asking about this oh yeah oh it's a short sleeve because i have a long sleeve skate tee dude you gotta send that to me dog 
I know. That's why I pulled it out. It's an XL too. Yeah, that's mine, bro. Uh. I have the Polo Skate Collection, so that'll come on another episode. Um, but we're going to end this one. But you guys better give this video a thumbs up. Please share this video. Subscribe to this channel. This is the long-anticipated Polo Archive. More coming next week. Very soon.